Hey guys, and welcome back to another unfiltered gamer board game review. And today's game up on the tabletop is Laboratory H's and Mr. B Games Dark Domains. Dark Domains plays two to five players. It takes about an hour and a half to play and is for ages 13 and up. And in the game Dark Domains, you're basically trying to accrue the favor of the necromancer. And to accrue the favor, you need what? You need to be evil. Yes, and <laughs> to be evil, you gain evil tokens. Because the necromancer doesn't care about wealth or trinkets or gold or any of that kind of uh, pointless uh, physical or tangible objects. He wants you to convert the townspeople and make cities of light turn dark. And also, he wants you to... Uh, well, what else do you want to do? He wants you to fight adventurers recruit and monsters. corrupt them or destroy them, recruit yeah. monsters, hire henchmen, mm -hmm. and um, basically manage spells, evil spells. to best <laughs> control the domain and turn it dark because the game is going to allow you to place down locations on a player board. In the game, you're basically going to have the main board of the game, which is the town. You'll have your player board, which is your city or your domain. And then there is the adventurers, the traveling adventurers who hang out in the taverns and they're going to come and pay you a visit, depending on if they want you to or not, they want to or not, during the game. And if they pay you a visit, they can be uh, beneficial if you're playing the light and nice side of the game, or they'll fight you if you're trying to be a little more evil. Now, of course, being evil means gathering evil points, and having the most evil points in the game is how you win at the end, which is the most important, which is why you're going to want to do that in the game. And that's pretty much the idea of the game. Yeah. There's a lot of different aspects to it, which we'll go into. It's a worker placement game. Yeah, you're First placing foremost, down your, your minions mm -hmm. to go and do your evil deeds. And uh, you're going to have different minions depending on the cards you gather, based on the different uh, characters you'll be uh, recruiting throughout the game. Uh, there's a ton of different spaces. There's a ton of things you can do in the game. And there's a bit of luck, too, involving how the adventurers move and where they go and how they affect you. But that has a lot to play on your choices in the game as yep. well. So anyway, down below we'll take it. I'll try and give you the full runaround. And if I goof up, she's gonna be here to correct me because I'm sure that I will. But <laughs> let's go ahead and take it down below. I'll show you Dark Domains, what comes in the game as much as I possibly can fit. And then we'll talk about what we think about the game and how it plays and whether you should pick it up down below. Link in the description. Here we go. Welcome to Dark Domains, and due to the size of this game, I only have one player board, but that's all we'll need in order to show you the basic concept of the game. I'm probably not going to go through all the rules here, because there is quite a few things you can do in the game, but I'll give you a rundown of how it functions. And the basic idea is to set the game up. You're going to take these monsters, other than the ones with the gold, set those ones aside, shuffle these guys up, and put them all down here in the spaces provided. Place the turn marker on the fortune track at the very beginning it'll go all the way down to the end of turn phase this will signal a full round you're going to make this fortune deck as well the bottom five cards will include the uh, death card in it which is basically going to end the game you're going to shuffle those up and form the bottom pile then you're going to take the next four cards along with the world cards shuffle those up and place it on top and then finally five random cards including these two shuffle those up and make the deck for the game in which you're going to have two pop out and go ahead and take two and put them up right here then you're going to have these are the different domains or the different buildings you'll be building on your domain board. Go ahead and shuffle this deck light side up, place out seven of them with the spots provided along with the action spots there. You won't miss them. You know where to put them. Then you're going to have the mercenaries, these guys over here, shuffle up this red deck, place two of them face up here and two of them face down over here. Shuffle each of the four different decks of cards here, the attack, the defense, the production, and then this one here, which is called the control spells. And these are going to be cards you'll use throughout the game, uh, which you will have to use mana in order to spend on them. Uh, additionally, you'll have the courtesan, go ahead and place him and his token right here next to the royal court. Have this guy out somewhere, he's going to be an extra action as well. As the t four different types of die, two of each, place them anywhere on the board that you want. I place them in the river because there's enough room there. And the first player marker over here. Additionally, you're going to go ahead and place the adventurers in each of the different taverns. There's two taverns, you have the green unicorn, and over here you have the yellow swan tavern. You'll always be going left to right when it comes to focusing on these taverns here. Go ahead and shuffle this deck up and place four here in the slots provided, along with four over here. There are additional cards here which you may or may not use. For additional rules, find them in the booklet. 
Otherwise, take and set aside any additional cards that you'll have for the Tarot deck or your Fortune deck, along with anything else you wouldn't be utilizing in the game. Uh, there's going to be a pool of a bunch of resources, whether they be elements, whether they be money or tokens you'll use throughout the game that provide a permanent or partial bonus. There is a bunch of different... Uh, materials building. you'll use yeah material building materials you'll use they'll consist of metal workers wood and stone go ahead and place those on the board somewhere as well and then of course the final and most important thing about this game is evil these are the evil tokens you're going to be trying to obtain these throughout every round during the production phase and as you gather these hopefully you'll have more than anybody else at the end of the game when the death card triggers from the fortune deck Give each player a player board along with their player colors. Uh, you'll be getting four of these guys here. Set one aside. These are your workers throughout the game, but you can gain more of them, obviously. Go ahead and make sure that they correspond with the outside border edge. That is det detailing what workers you get, uh, as well as these uh, two different types of elements you can choose of the four different types. Water, earth, wind, and fire. Those are the four you can choose from. Uh, the reasons why you'll want to select certain ones are probably going to be based on your cards here, which you're going to be able to choose three of from these decks here in any order, any uh, number of times equaling up to a total of three in your hand. These are the bottom of the costs of the cards to play them. One to three of any element, and these both require earth. So maybe you want to choose the different types of elements based on the cards you draw to begin with. You'll also get eight coins or currency that will be used to buy certain things throughout the game, mainly resources on the board here. So that's the setup for the entire game. Do that for every single player. And then you can begin by selecting a starting player. When that player has the starting marker, you'll begin the game and you'll start going down each of these eight phases and you'll rinse and repeat. So with fortune phase, what happens in the fortune phase, Callie? Uh, that's usually when you reset the board. Obviously, the first turn you don't need to do that, and you'll read the fortune cards and what they, what kind of effect they have for immediately or for the round. So in this instance, we're not going to need to reset the board, but if we had pieces missing, you're gonna fill them out from the pool. If we had these pieces missing, you put more out here. If these guys were gone, or in, when, at the end of every round, regardless, you'll take any guys that remain here face up, remove them, take the face one down here. If there are any, place them face up over here take new ones from the deck and put them over here face down if none of these remain simply put two face up here and two face down here uh, these decks remain the same these decks are going to remain the same because these will be switching out throughout the game during the adventure phase and any workers you may or may not have on the board go ahead and move them off to the side during the fortune phase of the game additionally you're going to go ahead and look at these two cards and it will tell you if paired with this or this do the bottom uh, it, or do the top. If it's not paired, then do the bottom. So in this case, we have a purple and a blue symbol. And this says if it's paired with a blue or a green, which it's not, you would do this. And if this was paired with a purple or a green, which it's not, you would do this. So you ignore these two, go to the bottom, and do what they say. Some might say something like this one. It says both adventuring parties fight with an extra D10 this turn. That's just really nasty. But luckily... Uh, actually, no. Unluckily, we'll have to deal with that. And these will remain up throughout the round. Sometimes they're instant effects, sometimes they're beneficial, sometimes they're not so beneficial. Once you go through each of them from left to right, those are going to be done or stay in effect, and you'll move on to the next phase, which is the prep phase. The prep phase usually doesn't do much, but if you have something to use during the prep phase, maybe certain characters, like for instance certain this guy men. here, you can go ahead and utilize his ability during the prep phase, as well as certain spells. And to, the symbol yeah. tells you when you can use it. Yeah, that to ability. know when you want to use the specific spell or henchman, it will tell you in the top right hand corner uh, uh, of every single card, including the spells over here as well. So this one could be used during the prep phase. Yep. Then minion phase. Minion phase is fairly simple as well. You're going to be placing in turn order, clockwise around the board, minions on spaces on the board. Each of the spaces has a number and a thing that they're going to give you, basically. And the reason why you're going to want to place them in certain numbers is going to be based on this resolution phase. Because during the resolution phase, everything will get resolved from in numerical order from lowest number to highest number. Highest being, what, 17, I think, which is the royal court. Yeah. So... All the spaces. Let's go in them really quick. Look at the top three of the seer deck. Put them back. Business district. Do draw two coins. Put them in your pool. Uh, the temple of the black cult. You get two evil, which is victory points. 
Over here is the Assassin's Guild. You can pay 12 coins to assassinate somebody, or if you want to use the Street Thug, you can pay two coins and roll a d6 and you'll have a chance to assassinate somebody. Assassinations can be on minions, on, um, on workers, and on monsters. Then you have the Architect's Guild. Six equates to all of these spaces here. You'll place one down here, you'll take this, which can be used later in the game. Seven, you're gonna have the Wayward Dragon. You'll go ahead and select one of these guys based on the spaces available and put it in front of you. This is a lasting effect. These guys will help you throughout the game. Over here, you got the Builder's Guild. Any number of monster or minions can be in here, or builders, whatever you're gonna call them. Uh, the workers, I should say, sorry. Will let you then be able to, on your turn, per, or during the uh, prep phase, or your resolution phase, you'll be able to purchase the resources, wood, rock, and workers based on the requirement, one coin for two wood, or one rock, or two workers, and two coins for one metal. Nine over here, placing them on these areas here will give you those elements of that type. Over here is going to let you draw three cards of any type, just like you did at the beginning of the game, from any of these four decks. Eleven will let you remove the leader, slide these guys along, and add a new one to the deck, which is important. I'll explain that later. Twelve will do the same thing. Thirteen is going to let you hire a foreign mercenary. Uh, Fourteen over here will let you hire these face-down minion guys. Fifteen will let you buy these Zomp monsters and all kinds of other goodies for the cost bottom right and allow you to place them on your board You can place them on your board either in an empty space or in a space with a dark city area 16 lets you have two coins and you will become the new first player and 17 is the royal court You'll get two coins you'll get this extra worker for next round You can utilize both of these to symbolize you'll be taking it next round Make sure you put this one back so other players can acquire it later though then, after that, you're going to move on to resolution. You'll resolve everybody's things in the order I described, and then you'll move on to the foreman phase. The foreman phase is pretty simple. You're going to go ahead and take one of... If you took this from a previous phase, like the tomb here, you're going to then notice there is a cost. And the cost on this one here is two rock, a metal, and two workers. If you have that, you can pay for it and then put it on your board in any of the open, empty spaces. This is going to grant you production value on the um, left-hand side. This says one evil production value. And on the right-hand side, it tells you what evil you're going to generate if you were to flip it over. There's a defense cost or total on the top right-hand side. And on the left-hand side is a symbol dictating what type of building it is. So if I paid the resources, I can put it on my board. Some of them also have a restriction on where you can place it. So this one can only be played in the mountains. Doodle 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 yep. doodle. So there's the mountain, yeah. Some of them have very, the restriction is right there, usually tells you. Always on this side, it will tell you what you're going to be getting every production phase when it turns to the black side, which as you can see is here. And then, of course, the defense, the type of building, and the costs associated with the specific type of building. Everybody can build during this phase. After that, simultaneously, you guys will say you're done. And remember as well, during any of these phases, if you have a card, that matches with that phase, you can go ahead and play that card, provided that you have the resources required in order to play that card. Like for instance, if you wanted to play Desecration at the end of the game, at the end of the turn, you need to pay one evil and one water element, and you can then do whatever this card specifically says. And that will work for every single spell card in the game. The adventure phase. The adventure phase looks at the leaders of the parties. Each party is separate, and you're always gonna start with the green unicorn, and then you're gonna move on to the yellow swan tavern. If you want to avoid dealing with these guys, you probably want to try and destroy them utilizing these spaces here. Otherwise, you're going to stick them on your opponents. How it works is fairly simple. It tells you the gender of the leader. It tells you the die associated with that leader. It tells you what the leader is going for first and then second. And the way you do it is you check. You're going to look at every player's board and then you're going to look at the symbol. Look for the building that has this symbol on it and is it dark? If the answer is no, if there's no dark buildings on the board of this symbol type, you'll then check this symbol type. And this symbol actually refers to a space or a region on the board. Are there any black air cities or areas on this area of the board or on anybody's board? If the answer is no, then you'll move on to back to this side. With this one here, now they'll go, you'll go, does anybody have a light building with this symbol? If no, move on to this one. If there's no as well, no light areas on this area here as well, then you're going to move on as well and nothing will happen and this guy will get discarded now if they do run into a monster let's say or an evil location of some type you're going to battle and when you battle you'll look at the entire party you'll take all of their die and in this case you have 12 12 
an eight and an eight sided dice. You'll take these guys here. You roll it against that building's defense. If the party's offense number is higher than that building's defense number, the party will destroy that building and everything on it. Don't forget any special effects from the co fortune cards. Yeah, so in this case here, you'd actually take an extra D10 and you'd roll it along with the party, which makes it very challenging. If the building was light and there was no dark buildings on the mountains, let's say, and there was just one light building on, on a mountain and it was happened to be on this board here, then the party would actually go ahead and give that building one money, one currency, for just venturing there as though they were going to the tavern to have a drink, and then the party leader would leave. Uh, depending on the type of locations they go, what, what they do on their turn will determine how many of these guys will leave and how many will push across the board and what you're going to replace. But that's the basic idea is they'll each go separately as parties and attempt to raid or help a local village. That's how the adventure phase works. Remember, you can also play cards during this phase to either help you defend or attack the villagers. And if you do, if you do, yeah, the adventurers, if you do successfully defeat the adventurers, you're going to gain three evil as well, which is what Cali did the entire game. Production phase. Production's cool. How it works, like I said before, is you're going to look at your board as well as any monsters on your board, and you're going to check the bottom left hand areas. And then you're going to gather the evil and or the Usually coins. Coins, sometimes elements as well. There's a coin you can gather, and then there's workers you can gather as well. So there's all types of things you can gather, but you're only going to gather them based on what's on your board. So if this was your board like that, you're going to gain two evil on your turn for the production. Remember, you're going to want to start off probably getting coins and then move on from there, gathering your evil. The last thing. End of turn, resolve any end of turn effects, play any end of turn cards, and use any end of turn minions or mercenaries. And then you're going to move on to the fortune step, which you're going to go ahead and clean up and start over again. One little thing I didn't mention, which is vitally important. During the minion phase, it's not on the board, but one action you can take, which you can't take until after the first round of play, is you can take a minion or a worker, and you can place it on a white building on only your board, and then when you do that during the resolution phase, before anybody else takes anything here, you can flip those over and turn them to the dark side. Turning to the dark side is great because it gives you more victory points, most mm -hmm. likely. <laughs> and that's great. However, these guys are much more fond of destroying evil than helping the light. So be careful where you place them and the type of building that they are because you might run into some partying adventurers that want to destroy your crypt or your, I don't know, cavern. So... Other than that, though, that's pretty much everything you, know, you need to know about the basics of the game. I didn't explain any of the spells or any of these guys here, but maybe we'll come up and talk about them as well as what some of the monsters can do. Move throughout the game and start again replenishing these, of course, flipping over two new ones of these guys here, checking to see what they do. When you run into two specific ones here, there's going to be the world, which is this one here, which will turn all of your buildings, uh, two light buildings, yeah. into dark ones. And then the death symbolizes the end of the game. After this phase is over, the game will end, triggering the, the last turn of the game, Dark Domains. I think I covered everything. Yes. If and at the end of the game, the person with the most evil. Evil. Nothing, nothing else really matters wins. All right, come up. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. Dark Domains is a worker placement game that has a bit of luck attached to it, but a lot of mitigation. So you can kind of deduce how you want to play the game, based on what pops up on the board. The adventurers are the most deadly thing in the game, I would say even more so than your opponents, but your opponents can manipulate those adventurers to make them have to fight you as opposed to fighting them. They are out looking for blood, and as they progress throughout the game, they are going to attempt to destroy any dark buildings and monsters available to them, or give coins to Callie if they want as well. <laughs> you want to be a little more subtle with your evil in the beginning. Just a little less evil than the other people around the table. Yeah. To begin the game, I would suggest starting by gathering your resources and mm -hmm. coins, making light buildings, and having the adventurers help you rather than hinder you. But that being said, the faster you start to flip over your cards by placing workers on them during the minion phase, the faster the buildings go dark, which means victory points. And at the end of the game, that's all that matters. You can have as many resources and coins as you want, but it's all frivolous if somebody else has more evil points than you do. And the way you get evil points is a couple spaces on the board, but mainly 
the production phase when your buildings are dark. It's mainly going to be your production phase from your dark buildings and from your monsters that give you those evil points. There's some other ways as well, spells, uh, yep. and of course, atta- winning an, a battle with the adventure. Which I would have no idea about yeah. whatsoever, <laughs> but uh, she knew. She found out three times how to gain victory points from that way. But yeah, there's plenty of ways to gather evil, but it's mainly going to be at some type of cost or at least some type of danger. So mm-hmm. how you choose to push your luck in this game will determine how well you do and also how well you choose to mitigate that luck. It will also determine whether you are successful or not. Uh, there are a lot of different parts to the game. Yep. There is a ton of different choices, and I think in a two and maybe even a three player game, there are more options and less likely options. So when you play with more players, there will be less spaces available to you to place, and thusly you'll start using spaces you normally wouldn't use in a two or even maybe three player game. Yeah, and I think when you get into those higher number players, it's probably more likely that the first turn player marker will be switching hands more often because we didn't see a need to really have to take that because well i wanted it uh one of my games i played with her but i ended up just letting her keep it anyway in attempts to not use the worker Uh, a lot of worker placement games it feels like the workers are of extreme benefit and the more Mm. you have the better you're going to do which in my case for that specific game came to definitely help because i obtained a character a a one of these guys here the uh, mercenary guys and they let me spend coins to gather an extra worker in addition i had the uh, cortisone the cortisone cortisone as much as i possibly could because i kept losing to the adventurers and i kept making poor choices selecting spaces on the board that led to my inevitable defeat and the die rolls didn't help either so it does make a difference, and going first is of yeah, benefit. Is, yes, but it's I say not it's as... probably more in the more, oh, more players. Oh, it, it definitely yeah. is. Uh, You'd probably be yeah. utilizing, like in our two-player version, we didn't uh, game, we didn't utilize a lot of the other spaces, like, I think we only did getting the gold like once, right? Uh, yeah, there yeah. are reasons why you would want to gather gold, yeah. because based on the way in which the... Uh, resolution phase goes from the lowest number to the highest choosing to get the two gold at the very beginning as opposed to two gold and the first player marker at the very end will determine whether you can use that gold in uh, the builders guild to buy certain things so there there plays a lot of choice yes you only have your four maybe five minions to to make those decisions i think six is the max you can have yeah technically using all of them use everything um there is a lot of artwork in the game Mm -hmm. and a lot of different artwork. I think it all looks great. I think they did a good job of making this look like a dark feudal land uh, in need of serious help. Dark fantasy. And unfortunately we are making it worse. We are corrupting it more. We are Mm -hmm. destroying the evil as, as they come. So yeah, it looks great. Uh, the quality of the components are excellent. The die are very nice as well. I, there's, I have no complaints whatsoever on the components. All of the mm-hmm. cardboard chits are nice and there's, thick and yeah, will last. Yeah, and there's so much in the game. <laughs> Even the first player marker, they went a little extra and made a big, a big noticeable. Yeah, rather than a little coin token, they did a big one. Yeah. Mechanics. Mechanics. Yeah, there's a lot of choice. Um, yeah. I like that. Even though it's worker placement. And resource management, that's not the, like, main part of... I mean, it is a big part of the game, but it's not what's going to determine if you win or not. It's it's just how you want to play your kind of overall strategy rather than each individual choice making a huge impact. It depends on the game, but I always think yeah. that it's going to be based on where you place your towns, when you turn them evil, and when, what the yeah. adventurers are trying to do. It's Those are the most important things. How fast or gradually you go evil, and when you choose to do that, rather than um, exactly how many resources you have to do this certain thing. It's also a nice, interesting aspect to this game because usually worker placements, when you're playing them, uh, when you add extra players, new spaces on the board get added and you have to figure out, okay, this space is added for this one, this space is added for this one based on the number of players. With this one, everything is available and your choices just get uh, more bogged down in a, in a larger game, but not to the point where you feel like you have nothing to do. It's just instead of having 30 options, now you only have, you know, 10 or something like yeah, that, which works fine. Yeah, a lot of choice, yeah. Um... Some unique mechanics I like. The, mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys know about the crossroads mechanic in the game Dead of Winter, uh, where you're basically crossroads. having other players. 
That's why I said, yeah. Uh, basically, you're having other players draw cards for your turn, and if you do a specific thing, then that card will trigger and something unique will happen. Uh, this kind of functions like that during the fortune phase of the game. You'll draw two of these fortune cards. Not only does it act as a round tracker, but additionally, it lets you do two abilities or two other ones based on whether these cards get paired or not. And there's already a ton of extra cards in the game, so there's always going to be a lot of variety as well as the different types of things you can do during the game. And it's based on a tarot deck, so it's it's based on the suit. If the suit matches pentacles or wands, then you do the special effect. Or if it's paired with an arcana card, you do the special effect. Yeah, and so the effects can be either positive or negative based on whether that happens or not, and what type of card it is. There's also some unique types of cards as well mm -hmm. that will allow you to do things like the Emperor switching and flipping over cards and getting some type of benefit or some negative effect that can trigger throughout the game. Really, really cool. The Adventurers is a really unique concept that I had to get used to at first because they're so aggressive, mm -hmm. and you have to realize that you need to control them or they are going to destroy you. And they sometimes are powerful. And sometimes you're not ready for them. Yes. You have to be willing to also determine whether you want to place your minions or your monsters on top of your buildings. Yes, it will increase the defense of that building space, but if the warriors go there or the party adventuring party goes there and defeats that space, you lose it all, which happened twice to me, <laughs> which is really debilitating. <laughs> but that's the price you pay for trying to put things together as opposed to space them out. Uh, and in regards when you roll 26, and when your face is only 20, you lose. Yep, so be, be, be aware of that. There, there's some ways to mitigate the rolls. Uh, there's, there's, there's the spell, spell, cards. Spell, spell cards. Some of the monsters have special abilities too that I made sure to get a couple of those that had a... Some of the buildings uh, also the buildings will well. have bonuses to defense on opposite buildings. It Surround, just, on, surrounding on surrounding buildings, yeah. yes. It just doesn't help when they attack that specific building yeah. with a monster on it. Yeah. Ah. But that actually affects then how you're placing your uh, tableau, and yes. how you're building your domain. Because there are, there's cool. four different areas in your domain, and then there's four spaces in each of those areas that can hold monsters, light buildings, or dark buildings, and or monsters. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of spaces to go. Uh, artwork in the game, like I said, solid quality of the components, mechanics are really good. Uh, uh, negatives that I have to look through is you have to be able to accept that die rolls will not always be in your favor, regardless of how fortified well, you and well playing. you've <laughs> adjusted your board. Sometimes, even if they just roll 2d6s and they need a 12, the 12 can be rolled. And if you don't have additional cards to mitigate that, block that, or something like that, you're, you're going to suffer the consequence of having it destroyed. Sometimes the players are going to want to be very aggressive. The game is an aggressive game in general. Not only are the other players out to make sure you don't succeed and potentially do things to that can harm you with the spell cards specifically, and also placing on spaces that you may or may not want or gathering buildings you may or may not want, but also they can move the adventuring party to a new leader, thusly making them attack you as opposed to yourself. So for people who like that... that matches a lot with the theme, though. Of, yes. Of being uh, evil... Yeah, everybody's really evil in this game. Of a dark domain. So expect to be evil. Pitting your enemies, your other evil brethren under the bus, <laughs> sending the adventurers their way, or or just atta straight up attacking one of their buildings. You attacked one of my buildings. Yes. It's fine. Yeah. I defeated it. It yes. had one defense. <laughs> uh, not only that, but uh, this game does feel like another game I've played before, a uh, worker placement called Evil High Priest by peterson games the guys who do cthulhu wars and uh, i really really like that one this one has that feel but it is a little different you are building your tableau and you are moving placing workers and whatnot but they are unique games in their own right i'll be keeping both of these games and i do enjoy them uh you just have to be ready for an aggressive experience have mm -hmm. to be ready to mess with your opponents and be aware that you may not always succeed in your endeavors you best be best laid be plans have to be ready to be evil and a little bit of chaos is going to come along with that because obviously if you're evil you know karma <laughs> any, any negatives for you um uh, yeah i'd say it did feel um the the die rolls at least for our game our two-player game it was not in your favor at all which made me feel bad which maybe i shouldn't be if i'm an evil <laughs> overlord but uh 
that seemed a little unfair and uh but otherwise it's just that there's a lot in the game so you can get bogged down trying to think well what do i want to do and really but really it's more about your overall strategy rather than each individual decision which is good so if you're interested in taking a look at dark domains which i basically explained the full game for you already which i've i've killed out half the work for you so you can basically get into the game <laughs> one thing i really didn't explain is about monsters and some cards and some mercenaries yeah. and what they do but those are all pretty much read and play and all the different little icons but you can see that in the rule book they have a handy dandy little chart the only thing they're also missing that bothers me slightly oh, yeah, is yeah. they don't have a reference in in, in any sort uh it like would have been nice one page even if they just have the back here yeah all the icons and what they mean because they do have like um, uh, an appendix and like all that kind of stuff spread in out between different pages but i'd like so it all just in one it. page mm -hmm. somewhere and they also don't have the monster append they don't have a monster appendix which is not really needed but bizarre that they had every other appendix yeah, <laughs> yeah. but i won't dock have any points on that regardless so take a look at down below for dark domains if you want to go ahead and pick this game up by laboratory h i i recommend it for those of you who like a thicker thicker worker placement with lots of choice and aggressive style placement and it's longer too yeah hour and a half maybe two, two hours. hours two hours yeah if you know how to play about an hour and a half if you're just learning maybe two and a half so you'll add that, tack that extra time on. I know if we if we play the two player game again, it'd be a, a lot yeah, faster. Yeah, it would I think. be. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> That's all. That's it. So go ahead and pick it up down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Really appreciate it, and as always, I look forward to. I'm gonna think of a good one. No, 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 not that one. I gotta think of a good one. Building a dark and evil fortress in the dark domains with you. Next, next time. time.